So I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. I know it can be really crazy with like holiday weekends. I know this is like a huge temptation to be like, man, I've had enough of people and I don't want to see any more people. But you're here and I'm so glad you're here. I'm just so happy to see everyone. I know we have people traveling and all that stuff. It just, it's just a crazy weekend. And we're coming into my favorite season. Christmas time is my favorite time. It doesn't feel like it. I know we just got done. Like Thanksgiving should have been a week ago. I don't know what's going on this year in the calendar. But we're actually, today's December 1st, that Christmas season. I love Halloween and Christmas. There's something like really cozy about Christmas. Like something about like doing things you've always done. And going, like just having that time off. I read a lot uh, when, around Thanksgiving and Christmas. And like I try, I'm like a cat. I'm looking for like the coziest place in, that, in the house. And you don't, you don't ever see me for like two or three days straight. I just got a book and I'm cozy. And turn out all the lights except for the Christmas tree. That's all I need. <laughs> but there's something about like these stories that we tell, these traditions that we do, these, these things that we come around, not just for family time and togetherness. Obviously, I know our culture is very much aware of the importance of taking that time and just coming around a meal together, which is something I really wish was more of a habit and a rhythm in our lives beyond just Thanksgiving and Christmas. But even, even beyond that, when we tell each other these stories, these stories of bigger meanings, these stories that remind us of the bigger things that are going on. I mean, the Christmas stories of, of the birth of the Messiah, of the star and the three wise men, and of Joseph and Mary and, and the virgin who was pregnant and gave birth, like all of these, these stories that we're so familiar with that we've been telling each other for over 2,000 years have so much meaning and so much symbolism and so much depth to them. But they're also about real people. I mean, these are stories about just, most of them are just ordinary people. There's nothing special about them. There's nothing unique about them. They're just regular people who got swept up into this greater story. These people who were living lives and all of a sudden their plans change. All of a sudden something happens to them and the story of their lives takes this abrupt turn into a different direction. Man, I know that can happen to us too. I mean, I, I know for, for many of us who are planners, that can be really stressful when things don't go according to plan. But I know there are many of us, we love to think ahead. We love to, to, to plan everything out. Like, I don't know if you're like me, like Sarah and I, we, we operate on four different calendars that we share on our phones. I got my calendar, she's got her calendar, we got the family calendar, we got the church calendar, and like all four of those, like, I, and we're like anytime we wanna do something, like Thanksgiving, we gotta plan it all out. We gotta think, okay, what time? I gotta take the girls to my mom's house, at what time then I'm gonna be at here and this, you know? Like if you're like me, you love to like make lists, you know, like all right, if we're gonna do this, then what are the steps to get us there? What are the things that need to be done? One of the, one of the, 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 the most gratifying experiences in my life is like I use an app called To Do, and when I like, when I tap that like checkbox and a task is like checked off my list and it goes ding, and I'm like, oh yeah, like that's just my favorite thing. I'm like, oh, that's so satisfying. Sometimes like I'll, even after I've done something, I'll still put it on my list and then immediately ding it off because I just want the satisfaction of that ding sound, man. It makes my life have meaning. Okay, it doesn't, but you get my point. Like we love making lists. We love planning ahead. Like, like what if like all of our Christmas plans are already done? Like I know if you're traveling for Christmas, it can be really challenging. Like, I know some of us, maybe we have our five-year plan, right? Like, where am I going to be in five years? What's my career going to be in five years? What's, what's our family going to be like in five years? What, what, are, what are my hobbies going to be like in five years? I know weddings are one of those things that, like, big plans for weddings. And that's one of those things, especially in our culture, it seems like every year and year, more we, we have the, the idea of what our wedding plan has to be like. This is exactly, I, I, I don't know if it's like, like social media and Pinterest. I'm like, I'm glad I got married before Pinterest because like the way our wedding went and it was wonderful and we loved it, but we couldn't compete with like the rest of the world on the best of the best on Pinterest, you know, but everything's got to be exactly that. This is what the tablecloth is planned to look like. This is what the centerpiece is going to look like. And when we walk in, he's going to say this and then that's going to happen. And then, you know, and we just, we get so detailed in those plans sometimes. And so often in life, things just don't go according to plan. I mean, we, don't, we don't get to control that all the time. We don't get to ensure that things go the way we want them to go. I mean, sometimes we find ourselves not just like, oh, the wedding didn't go exactly how I wanted it to go. 
or oh, the, this vacation didn't go exactly, or this holiday season. Sometimes it's not that. Sometimes it's more serious things. And sometimes it's like, man, I didn't plan on getting laid off. Here I am working, and I'm trying to prove my worth, and now I find myself job hunting. That's what I'm doing now. I didn't plan on being separated right now. We were going to be together. This was going to be long term. We were going to get old together, and now we're not even together at all. I didn't plan on having these medical issues that I'm dealing with. This is such a major part of my life now. This is a big deal. I didn't plan on this. I plan on doing other things with my time and other things with my I didn't plan on having these bills right now. Maybe it's, it's really personal sometimes. I didn't plan on saying what I said. I said it, and it's out there. And I regret it, and I didn't plan on saying it, but it's said. I didn't plan on doing what I did just now. I wish it had gone a different way. It just happened. I didn't plan on losing what I lost. Man, some of these, sometimes these change of plans can really rattle us. Sometimes these change of plans can really change everything for us. That's part of what's going on in this Christmas story. As we're looking at these, these different people who are swept up into this bigger story. One of the things we want to look at, I just want to tell their story. And I just want to remind us, like, remember, these are real people that got swept up into this story. Look at the things that they did. Look at the decisions that they made. And what can we learn from that? Because when you're looking at Joseph, probably the most famous stepdad in history, right? This guy Joseph, I mean, this is exactly what's going to, on with him. You've got two verses, you know, where we see, really, it's in between those two verses in the Bible. Where it's like, here's Joseph, and he's a good guy. Next thing you know, plans change. We see that in, in the very first chapter of Matthew, the beginning of the story of Jesus. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to exp expose her to public dis disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Okay, there's a lot going on in those two verses, right? Like, I love how, like, we just kind of, like, gloss over that, you know? Like, I mean, you read between the lines and see what's going on there. I mean, can you just imagine this scenario? I mean, can you just imagine this, this scenario? Like, who this, like, Joseph, probably, he's a young guy. He's a young man. Like, he's probably a good-looking guy. He's very charming. He's very charismatic. He's got friends. People like him. He's going places in life. I imagine he's a guy with a really neat beard, maybe a slick fade, you know? Like, he's, he was always dressing well, you know, not the fanciest stuff. He doesn't have a lot of money, but at least no, he puts himself together okay. You know, like this is a guy who probably, he goes to church every Sunday. Well, he's Jewish, so he probably goes to synagogue every Saturday, but he's always there every weekend. He volunteers on the worship team. I bet Joseph was one of those guys. Plays acoustic guitar, you know what I mean? Like looks at people when he's singing about the Lord. All the women swoon when he's singing. It's like, are you worshiping God or him? You know, like what's going on here? You know, he's playing that. Like he's, he's in college. He's studying to be a carpenter, right? He's got career ambitions. He's got uh, uh, goals in life. He's going places. And then he met this girl, Mary. Oh, the girl of his dreams. This beautiful, amazing woman. And he awkwardly asked her on in a date. And she said yes. They went out to the Nazareth coffee shop. I don't know. What, what do you got to do in Nazareth? I don't know. Like walk on the beach, I guess. Walk through the woods in the dirt. I don't know what you do to date in Nazareth in like 2,000 years ago. But whatever they did, they fell in love. Head over heels. This is amazing. Like he pops the question. I don't think they gave rings or something, but however he did it, I'm sure it was on one knee at the beach on the Sea of Galilee right at sunset, and the wind was blowing, and she said yes. And they were going to be married. And they were faithful to what God taught about relationships. I know this is this, this really wild idea about sexuality and marriage in, in our culture today. But they're like, man, we're going to save ourselves for marriage. Uh, that's the way that God teaches us. And that's what we're going to be faithful to. And they were faithful to that. I mean, they were like, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it right. We're going to be who we're supposed to be. You know, they were waiting until marriage. And everything, like their plans for the way things were going to go, were going that way. We're going to get married. I'm going I'm to finish college and I'm going to get my carpentry degree. We're going to get married. We're going to start a family. Mary's going to be a stay-at-home mom. Joseph is going to build his business up and open up a store. Maybe save up money and build a house on that beach in the Sea of Galilee where he proposed. They had a plan for where their life was going to go. You, just, you can kind of see that if you read between the lines. 
but then plans change. Then everything hits the fan. Everything falls apart. I wonder how that conversation went, right? Mary discovers she's pregnant. In the middle of all these plans with this wonderful man, with these wonderful plans, how did that conversation go about? Uh, hey, uh, you want to go for a walk? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I don't know, like, how you do that. Like, take out to the coffee shop, you know, you're like, all right, so I'm pregnant. I mean, can you imagine? Like, you, you see, like, like, later on, we know what happens with the story, but in that moment, in between those two verses, can you see the heartbreak that Joseph is feeling there? Can you see the devastation that he's experiencing? What? This is betrayal. You're not supposed to do this. What are you talking about? We had plans. We were doing, this is what we're doing. This is, we're coming together. Are you serious? You're pregnant right now? This is someone he trusted, someone he loved. They're going to spend their life together. Now what's going on? You're going to have another guy's baby? Like what's happening right now? And it's worse than just a personal betrayal too because this is a public humiliation. Right, they're engaged to be married, and in their culture, engagement was stronger than in our culture today. To them, engagement was actually closer to being married. I mean, they were promised to each other. And everyone knows this. How are we going to tell our family now? What am I going to tell them? I've, I've introduced you. I've brought you to Thanksgiving. You met them. You know what I mean? They like you. I like your family. How are we going to tell our friends? I mean, we got, the invitations are out. We got a non-refundable deposit at the wedding chapel. I'm going to lose that too. You know, like, what is, I mean, you can just see just this, this awfulness in between the lines there. This dark, low time that I'm, I can't imagine he wouldn't be. I mean, this is, he's going through this. I love, like, in the middle of all that, like, I'm sure Mary was like, no, 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 wait. Let, let me tell you the rest of it. See, I, I didn't cheat on you. It was God. <laughs> and he's like, so she's crazy too? Like, are you serious? Like, what happened? What's going on? Like, you don't even see this. Like, he didn't buy that. Like, she told him that. She's like, no, no, no. This is the Holy Spirit that got me pregnant. Okay, yeah, that's great. You lost it. You know what I mean? But like, but you see, he didn't buy that. He doesn't, he doesn't believe her at all. So he's like, I'm, I'm going to divorce her. I mean, that, 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 that engagement was closer to marriage, so he's like, well, we're going to get officially divorced now. And in that culture, there could be really negative consequences. You know, it wasn't good to be a woman in ancient times, right? So this was a dangerous place for Mary to be in. I think Joseph knows. Can you imagine that moment? Maybe he was tempted to get that revenge, tempted to be like, oh, things didn't go the way that I wanted them to go, and I'm angry about that, and I just want to lash out. He didn't choose that. Because, you know, things didn't go the way that I wanted them to go. I'm really hurting right now. We just need to end this and move on with our lives. We just need to end this and go on. I mean, there are times in our lives where we find ourselves in that place. There are times where we find ourselves betrayed or angry or shocked or just at a loss. There are times where I'm just trying to get to work and my car keeps breaking down and I just can't get ahead. There are times where I'm working in my company and I'm trying to prove my worth and then I got downsized and laid off. After all these years, after proving myself, there's that time where I find myself married to that wonderful person, but then we're hitting some serious potholes along the way. And I didn't ask to be struggling with these migraines. I didn't know that I was going to lose my scholarship. How was I going to know that my life was going to end up battling depression for years and years? I didn't know I was going to get injured in this way and have to deal with that. That is not what I planned. And I don't understand why that's happening. I don't understand why this is going on. I don't understand what to do now. I think a really difficult thing for us to accept just as humans in this world is we just don't always understand we just don't always understand even when we're being guided by god because what we're learning i think what we see from here is we don't always have to understand we don't always have to understand the plan 
things don't always have to go according to our plan. And they don't already. I mean, we want to know what's going on. We want to understand how this is going to play out. We want to be in control of what's going on. I know especially me, I remember when I took the, the Enneagram personality test. That's the, the, I was the number eight, and it said the number eight, they want to control everything and, and make sure things happen the way they want to happen. And I'm like, man, this is, uh, I'm reading the story of Joseph, I'm like, this is a story for me. Like, I know we want to, like, say this is how it's going to go. This is the best way. I want to make sure I do everything I can, and it just doesn't always work out that way no matter how much we want it to. One of the oldest pieces of wisdom in the Bible is this poem. It's found in a book called Proverbs, and it says this, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. It's a difficult truth that we have to accept, but God is calling us to trust him. We don't always understand the plan. We don't always understand what's going on. Things don't always go according to our plan. But God is calling us to put our trust in his greater purpose. Even when you don't understand, even when you don't see how it's going to turn out, God is inviting us to say, put your life into his hands, to trust in his ways, to be obedient to his ways, and trust that whatever it looks like, and you won't always see how it's going to happen, you don't always see how it's going to turn out, but if you're doing the way, if you're doing life the way God is inviting you to do it, then trust that he's taking care of you, and trust that his purpose will prevail, and it's better than your plan. It's this idea of surrender. It's this idea of openness. I'm not clutching everything to myself, but I have to surrender my life to God, and surrender my plans to him, and surrender my path to him, and as I'm doing it is a daily act of trust. This idea of faith in Jesus. We talk about we're saved by faith. That word faith is so full and robust. It doesn't mean just I believe in the doctrine of Jesus. No, with faith comes this idea of not only allegiance, that I give my allegiance to Jesus, which involves obedience, but also trust. I just trust in his ways. Man, I admit that I am a limited human being and I don't see everything in my life, let alone the whole world. And I'm just bouncing around like a pinball machine out here on this planet, but he sees it all. He knows it all. And I have to remind my limited brain to trust him. Because God wants us to trust his purpose. He wants us to be faithful to him. He wants us to do life his way. And sometimes it's not up to me to like work the outcome. Sometimes it's just up to me to be diligent in obedience. I'm just going to be faithful to God. That's all I can do in this moment. That's all I can control right now. And I trust. It's really a scary place to be in, but I can't imagine the reverse would be doing it on my own without having God's guidance at all. We see Joseph kind of got this right. I mean, he's really skeptical of Mary's claims. I don't know if just like I can go on just your word that the Holy Spirit got you pregnant. <laughs> you know? I don't know if I got to face my friends and family. I got to live a life with you where everyone's going to know. I don't know if I can live that life. My whole life is about to change. So he needed more than that. It says this. But after Joseph had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. He needed that nudge, but he eventually came to a place where he did trust God. This is crazy. This is not what I planned. This is not how I saw things going. And he needed that nudge, but finally he got to a place where he said, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to do this. 
If this is the path that he's opening up before me, it's not the path that I would have chosen for myself, but I'll walk that path. I'm going to trust that his way is better than my way. And sometimes we need that nudge. Sometimes we need that reminder because we're imperfect, right? We don't always automatically like are perfectly faithful to God. That's one of the reasons why we need community. That's one of the reasons why we need togetherness is because we need each other to speak into each other's lives, to speak truth into each other's lives, to speak love into each other's lives. I need other people with a different perspective around me who have a different perspective on my life that can help remind me of who I am and who God is calling me to be. I need people to speak that into my life. And sometimes we need that nudge. We need that conversation from a friend. We need to sit down with someone and be like, look, man, here's what I'm dealing with. And I'll be honest with you, this is how I feel about it. Sometimes we need to have that conversation because that friend can see something in our lives that maybe we can't see ourselves and can speak that truth and can give us that nudge and remind us of what we need to do or give us clarity to see what we need to be doing. We need that. Maybe not all of us have an angel appearing in our dreams, but we do have the whole cloud of saints is what the Bible says. Is those who are followers of Jesus, we're all following Jesus together. And as we follow him, we're following him with each other. And we're all in this boat together. And we're all helping each other out together. And we're just trying to navigate this life and this world together. And sometimes that means helping each other out. Sometimes it means, man, I see this going on in your life. And maybe this isn't a good idea. Maybe this isn't a good thing for you. Or you know what? I see this going on in your life. You just need to like bulldoze through it, man. You just need to stay the course. Or you know what? Maybe I'm just going to give you a kick in the pants because you're being an idiot right now. You know, whatever that is, sometimes we need that nudge. Because God doesn't seem to have a problem interrupting our plans. When we're faithful to him, he doesn't seem to have a problem interrupting our plans. He doesn't seem to like, no, I'm, I'm, oh, I can't do that. This is, this is really going to shock her if I do this in her life. No, no, he doesn't seem to have a problem with that. He's like, no, you know what? This is going to be different than what you're thinking. Because his plans are better than our plans. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are beyond our thoughts. See, we have to understand that God is smarter than us. And so his plans might be different than ours. And he doesn't seem to have a problem interrupting that. I think maybe part of it is because God's doing something bigger than just us that we're invited to be a part of. There are things going on in people's lives that maybe you're a part of that. There's someone who's being transformed and God wants you to cross their path. There's someone who's really struggling, and it's going to be a big deal if they can get to the other side of that, but they need you, who have already struggled with that, to share your experience with them. Well, maybe there's something going on in your own life where, like, man, there's a brighter light at the end of this tunnel, and it's better than what you thought. You just got to get through this. It's going to shape you in ways that you never imagined. I think sometimes God's greatest invitations can feel like the worst interruptions in life. We get so single-minded on our own specific plans that God's like, no, 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 you understand. Like, you're so, like, just set on this track, but you keep asking for God to guide you. And when he does guide you, that guidance can look like an interruption. It's like, all right, I'm going to wreck things and I'm going to get your attention because I want you to go in a different direction. I wonder if that can happen sometimes. I mean, that certainly happened with Joseph. This is the greatest thing. He was called to raise the Messiah, to be the father of the Christ. Like I said, the most famous stepdad in all of human history. But we meet him in this moment where God is just wrecking his life, interrupting everything. But so good it is. I think God wants to do something with our mess just the mess that is our lives, the mess that is our confusion. I think God wants to do something in the world. He wants to do something in the lives of the people around us. And I think that it's good that he wants to. It's good that he invites us to. But we can, I know it, it can be so tempting to feel like, sometimes it is, it is a change of plans. That is the interruption. That is God wrecking us. That is this craziness that we're dealing with in life. Sometimes it is vacation not going the way I I thought it would go. Sometimes it is, oh, uh, my plans got wrecked or, or I lost this or whatever it might be. Sometimes it's like truly bad things though, right? 
Sometimes it's like, no, 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 this isn't just like, oh, things didn't go the way. No, I'm dealing with some real bad stuff now. This just sucks. But what is that? Like, if I had to choose between living God's plan and dealing with this issue, I would just, I would not have to, you know, never mind. I don't want to be a part of it at all. I think we, uh, we see this in, in uh, the Apostle Paul talks about this when he was talking to Christians in Rome. He says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So I think the truth is God can use bad for good purpose. Not just interruptions, not just unexpected things, not just like wrecking our plans, but even truly bad things. That's what's amazing about God. Like, like this is what's, it's really a scandalous idea. Like even horrific things, God can use even bad things for good purposes. That there can be good things that come out of bad. I mean, that's what exactly was going on with Joseph and Mary. I mean, things did not get suddenly good for them. Like Joseph decided to, 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 to follow God's plan for him. But you, everyone else knew that she was pregnant. You know, this had to be the rumors. This had to be the scandals. Everyone knows. People are talking for the rest of their marriage as Jesus is born. And he grows up and he's a kid. He's like, oh, that's that kid when, you know, Mary got pregnant before they got married. You know, like this was, and in that culture, that was some really serious negative stuff that they had to deal with. They might have even faced some, some being ostracized and things like this. I mean, they're still struggling with this stuff. Things are not easy. But sometimes there's purpose even in pain. One of the most difficult realities I think we have to come to terms with is sometimes God uses suffering to do good in the world. It's not just like, I'm going to follow God and he's going to do things in my life and it's going to be good. His plan might involve suffering. I don't always know why. Like I said, we don't always know why. We don't always understand. Why? Why? Is there some greater purpose down the road? I don't always see it at the time. And I don't mean to say that God causes all suffering. I think he absolutely does and can cause some suffering where it's like, hey, man, like, I'm just going to take you through some, some hard stuff. I remember Sarah and I were, we were at this church in, in Lexington, and uh, we spent a year and a half there where we loved it, and things were going well. And then all of a sudden, like, chaos broke out. Like, the lead pastor had, had an affair with, Everybody, apparently, <laughs> like it came out, and then the church did not handle that well. Everyone, that was when people came out of the woodwork saying, now's my chance to take over. It was the ugliest. The, I mean, you had the scandal. You had broken marriages. You had broken people that had gone on that that was happening. And in the middle of that, you had people saying, this is, I can take advantage of this situation. And, 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 and influence. it was just ugliness. It was all, and we're caught up in the middle of this. I was a youth pastor, and I was like, man, I'm just trying to teach teenagers about Jesus. I don't even know what's going on. We're caught up in the middle of this. And I'm just thinking, like, what in the world? Is, I mean, it was horrible. It was really tough for us. And, and we found ourselves as the target of a lot of people like saying, oh, well, you're gonna, we're going to change things your way and we're going to do things this way. And we're like, what in the world is going on? But man, I got to tell you, man, God taught us a lot of really good lessons out of that. I mean, there, there did come a time where it was years later where we looked back and we're like, you know what? I'm, I, I kind of value that experience. I mean, at the time, I wouldn't say that. At the time, I'd be like, what the heck, man? You know, like, but years later, it's like, I, I kind of value that. Like, we had to suffer and deal with this stuff. But man, like, we really learned a lot from that. I, I don't know. I think God led us through that experience. I think God led us into that experience. But I don't think God causes all suffering and all bad things. I don't think we can, like, blame some of the horrific things that happen in the world. It's all part of God's plan. I don't know, man. I think God has his plan, but we have a choice of whether or not to live on track or go off the rails off of that. I think maybe some of that, some of the suffering and some of the difficult things, man, that's on us. We can't put that on him. We're not doing things according to his plan. Like Sarah and I were when we were going to Lexington, we were trying to be faithful to God. And God, where do you want us to go? And we went there and, well, God, what do you want us to do? And we're trying to make disciples and trying to point people to Jesus. We were trying to, to do God's plan. I think God led us into that. But there are times where it's like, dude, I'm not living my life according to God's plan. And these people aren't here aren't doing things according to God's plan. And because of that, things go nuts. And sometimes things get off the rails. And sometimes there's suffering and there's craziness that happens from that. And I don't think we can put all of that on God. 
I don't think we'd be like, well, why did God cause this to happen? I don't, I don't know. I don't think he did. But I think he can use it. Even if you're suffering because of your own bad decisions, even if you're suffering because something not of your own bad decisions, but because of something somebody else did, even if you're suffering because of, and it's not anyone's fault at all, it's just this crazy thing that just happened to you, even then God can use bad things for good purpose. God can lead us through that. God can guide us through that. I think of when our second daughter, Winter, was born, we, were, uh, we had just moved to Cincinnati. We had just gotten out of that crazy church, actually. We were in Cincinnati for two weeks. And we went to our first uh, doctor visit just to meet the doctor. And uh, at the end of the visit, she said, all right, well, you're going to have this baby today. And we're like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> we're just meeting you. But no, Winter was ready. She was, she was on her way. I mean, like, the delivery happened, like, super fast. I remember Sarah was at home, and, and I was like, oh, you're having this baby now. You need to call your mom. She needs to drive into town if she wants to see this baby. <laughs> like, right now, you got a few hours to go. And, man, she was born, like, super fast. She was out there. And uh, I remember, you know, we were in, you got that 24-hour period, and because Winter was born so late, it was a little bit, long, like, she was born at 3 in the morning. And so we didn't, we were there for a little bit longer than 24 hours. We didn't leave at 3 in the morning the next day. We left at like the afternoon. And so we were in their extended period, and she had failed her hearing test, or it was like inconclusive. And so they're like, oh, that's no big deal. Sometimes that happens. So they took her back to uh, have the hearing test done again. And while she was back there, she had her first seizure. Uh, it was while the doctors and nurses were looking at her doing this test. And I'm glad she failed that hearing test. I'm glad we stayed there a little bit longer than 24 hours because if she was in the car seat and that had happened on the way home, I don't, I don't know what would have happened. But she turns colors and she wasn't breathing and I was going to get our stuff and Sarah called me, didn't know what was going on. We get to the hospital. As soon as I get there, we're not in the maternity ward anymore. We're in a different, different part of the hospital where there's a lot of commotion going on and she's in this little box and she's hooked up to a lot of things and there's a lot of very serious doctors saying serious things to me in the moment and in the middle of the sentence, she has another seizure and there are alarms going off and I'm like, what the heck is going on here? What is going on? Next thing you know, we have to sign permission, and EMTs are coming into the room, and they put her in this transportation device, and they have to take her to the hospital, and we're like, what's going on? Sarah just had a baby a few hours ago. Let's get in the car. Let's go to Children's Hospital across town. We get there. We go up to this other place. We're in the NICU now. Once we get in there, oh, she had several more seizures. Why? We don't know. We got to do tests. They did all the tests. They, they looked at her brain. They, they looked at, our, does she have bacteria? Does she have all this other stuff? No, but she kept having seizures. They gave her seizure medicine. Did that stop? No, it didn't stop. And she kept having seizures. They increased the dose. It was this high dosage. She's a newborn infant. You're giving these brain drugs to her. But luckily, it stopped her seizures. We were there for several more days. We're like, what? what? What's causing this? We don't know. We don't know. They run every test. We had to sign permission because one of the uh, 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 Bengals players on the Bengals football team, he had a specialty made MRI machine for his knee that was small enough for winter. And so we had to sign permission. Can we put your baby in this knee machine so we can look at the inside of her brain? We're like, okay, I guess we're doing that now, right? And, and the, we came back. You know, then it's like, okay, we're going to stand here for two or three or four hours while we're waiting for the results. And we're sitting here like, What's going on? Like, we've done this before. We have a kid. We've had a kid. We know how this goes. This is, what is going on here? All these thoughts are going through our head. All right. This, what has God given us? I don't think I caused this. I don't know if God caused this. I don't know what caused this. But it's happening. And this is our lives. And I can't stop it. And we're having all those thoughts. It's like, okay, then this is the lives we're going to live now. We're going to have a hospital bed in our living room for the next, for the rest of our lives then, I guess. You know, we're going to go break the bank, spending all the health care costs and all the, every dollar is going to, all right, we're going to be poor from now on. No more vacations. That's just how it's going to be. Like we're like having, you know, I remember we we're having coffee and talking about like, all right, I guess this is, I don't know what's going on. But in that moment, I just, I just couldn't help but think like, what else can I do but just surrender to God? Be like, God, what? I just surrender this to you. I just surrender our lives to you. I don't know where we're going now. I mean, this is a pretty dramatic change in our lives. 
and I don't know, but be with me today. Help me get through today. And the Kepra worked. She didn't have any more seizures. We took her home. We had these tiny little syringes that we had to give her exactly the, the amount twice per day, because if you give her too little, the medicine won't work, and she'll have seizures. If you give her too much, well, it's a very powerful drug, and you'll mess her up. So, I mean, she's a baby, too. She spits up. So we, you know, like, we're like, new, we're like, <laughs> you know, trying to give her this medicine. We had to do that for six months, twice a day. We're going back every few weeks. They're hooking her brain up. I think we have a, a picture of it from when she was born. Hooking her up to all these machines and measuring her brain waves. Do we see any signs of, of seizure activity? Every time we go there, every time we walk into that hospital, my life might change. I might be a parent who has a dead child. I might be a parent with severe disability child. She might be normal. This might all go away. We have no idea. Every time we walk in that door, my plans changed. I have no idea what's going on. And every time, no signs of seizure. See you in two weeks. So does that, is that good? Well, we don't know. What's causing it? We don't know. All right, two weeks later, we walk in the door. No signs of seizure. So does that mean, like, she's not going to have another seizure? We don't know. That went on for six months. Until finally, the doctor said, well, I think we want to try to, like, step her down from the seizure medicine. And I said, well, like, do we feel, is she not going to have any more seizures? Oh, no, we don't know. Why do we want to take her off the medicine? We just want to see if she's going to have any more seizures. Wait, what? <laughs> you know, like, we're like, okay. So we stepped her down. We spent the next several months, like, slowly decreasing her. And then we take her in, and they'd measure, and they were like, all right, let's see if she had any seizures. None yet. All right, step it down a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. We did that for several months until finally they said, I think we're just going to take her off the medicine. Well, is she healed? Well, we don't know. Well, what's, why is she not having seizures right now? We don't know why she's not having seizures. Well, what should we do? We just take her off the medicine and see what happens. <laughs> okay. Can you imagine for like, we took off the medicine for months after that, every time she moved or squirmed. This could change our lives. This could change our plans. I mean, she's four years old now. She just turned four. She's over there right now. I mean, she's fine. The doctors have no idea what caused it. They have no idea what stopped it. But let me tell you, we spent an entire year of every day learning that lesson of, man, our plans could change, and we have no idea, and we can't do anything other than just put our lives in the hands of God and trust in something that he can do with this. It's not easy, and it's not pretty, but it's the reality of our lives. Sometimes that ends in a positive story like ours. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we see the good that God has done out of that. And we can look back and be like, I'm actually glad I got this disease because I was able to help this person. I'm actually glad this divorce happened because I was able to, this result came. Sometimes we can see that. Sometimes we just can't. And we're in this really difficult position of just trusting God. I'm going to trust him. But that's, he's got greater purpose. He's got greater plans than ours. He sees the things that we don't see. And even with this story of Joseph, this, this man who chose to trust in God's path for him, which was a difficult path, which continued to be difficult for them, they got a warning that the king was killing babies, and they had to flee to Egypt to get out of there. That's still what's going on, but they're on God's path. This is God's path for them, right? When she gave birth to him is when they were traveling. She's nine months pregnant, riding on a donkey hundreds of miles of, away from home. The baby was born in a barn. That was God's plan for them. Can you imagine Joseph still struggling with that, still wrestling with this like, man, I chose to do it God's way. What is going on? I still don't understand, but I have to trust his greater purpose. And man, what a greater purpose it was. 
even when Jesus grew up, grew into the man that he was designed to be, when he became the Messiah, where he was the Messiah, and started to live as that, even then it didn't go as planned, because the people thought that the way the Christ was going to change things was going to be more political, or maybe even more military, and you're going to throw off the Romans, and the kingdom of Israel is going to come back, and this kingdom is going to be powerful than all the other kingdoms, and we're going to conquer the whole world, and the exact opposite of that happened. A lot of people woke up to his message and were changed by it, and a lot of people absolutely hated him. Can you imagine that phone call? Hey, how's it going? So, you're the Messiah. I'm so proud of you, Jesus. So, how things are going? It's like, well, you know, I got a group of followers. Oh my gosh, you have followers already? How big is your church? I bet you got like 5,000 people already. We got 12, you know, like <laughs> 12 right now. It's like, really? Why only 12? Well, a lot of people really don't like what I'm saying, you know, but even that was God's greater plan. The Messiah who would even suffer and die on the cross for us. Can you imagine Joseph and Mary standing there seeing that? What is going on? I just spent my whole life trusting in God's greater purpose. And now my son is dying on the cross. I don't know if they could have seen 2,000 years later where we would be gathered. People who celebrate the salvation that Jesus gives us. Because he died on the cross for our sins. That message that would be told for millennia. This, this message that would change the whole planet. I don't think they could have seen that. 2,000 years of history of lives changed. But God saw it and God knew it. And I'm glad that they were faithful to that. Because of Jesus dying on the cross, we don't have to be good enough. We don't have to to follow the rules and to get in, to earn our way into heaven. Jesus was good enough and he died on our behalf. He invites us to put our faith and our trust in that. We trust him for our eternity. We trust him for the rest of our lives. And I put my life in his hands. What else can we do? My invitation for all of us today is to put our faith in the hands of God. When things are going well, let's celebrate that. Let's thank him for that. And when things are not going well, let's link arms and let's help each other and let's encourage each other and boost each other and be all the more faithful to God. Let's be honest with him in our prayers. Let's say, God, what the heck, man? Give me something here. You ever prayed that honestly with God before? Let me tell you, I did. <laughs> My challenge to all of us is to pray honestly, to be honest with God, to open ourselves to him, to trust in his greater purpose, even when we're going through the hard times, whether it's now or it's in the future. We have to be ready for that. There's so many more stories of the people who are getting swept up into the story of God. We look at Mary. We look at who this person really is. Kind of look beyond some of the religious stuff we've put on her. We actually see who this person is and the decision she made. It's absolutely incredible. When you look at John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, and how he plays a part of this story. You look at Jesus himself, his actual birth and who this person is. Like it's absolutely astounding. And I think it's inspiring. And I think it's challenging. And I think that sometimes it's tough, but I hope it's always encouraging. So let's pray together.